As I introduce our speaker tonight, I'd like to remind you of a message that the Apostle Paul has written to each one of us. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things you have heard from me entrust to reliable men who will be able to teach others. Here at Linda Road, as we thought about how do we fulfill this command to entrust to reliable men the things that Paul has taught to be able to teach others, one of the aspects that we have emphasized is to support uh, Christians who've chosen to commit themselves to a course of study at uh, Christian preachers' training schools. And tonight we have one of those with us, uh, Brother Jacob Sanford. Uh, he has uh, just begun his studies at Bear Valley, but he's seeking financial support to be able to continue those and finish those o over the course of the next two years. So as is our custom, we like to uh, bring those uh, students to before the congregation to allow you to meet them and get your uh, feedback and counsel on uh, providing support as they continue their studies. Uh, Brother uh, Jacob is from the Kansas City area. We have reached out to our contacts and he comes to us very highly recommended. And uh, one reason we invited him here and uh, he'll deliver our lesson tonight. Brother Jacob. Well, as Larry said, I'm Jacob Sanford, and I'm from the Kansas City area. I grew up in Oklahoma, and we've been in Kansas City the past uh, about four years. And some of the reasons uh, I went to Bear Valley, I was asked to discuss those. We had known some alumni uh, at a congregation we went to in Minnesota. Uh, Chris Graber and Randy Martin are a couple of the men up there. They're a youth minister and a pulpit minister and an elder. Uh, but we had known alumni, and I had met a visit to the school there in Denver. But for me, the, 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 the decision was more about choosing to do ministry instead of the school. So if I chose to do ministry and stuck with that, then we knew that Bear Valley would be a good option. So we kind of had to get that first uh, decision made before we picked the school. But from there, making the decision or going the way of ministry, we knew Bear Valley would be a good option uh, because of the people we knew and different things that had come from there. And the, what the school has to do with my spiritual life discuss some of that. There was uh, another student, his name is Russell, and he described Bear Valley as training ground uh, for ministry. That should be really obvious, but I'd never occurred to me to think of it that way, but it is a four-year program that's stuck into two years, and it is like a training ground, uh, kind of like that military analogy. And it's challenging, and it's, uh, but it's very rewarding, and it's, you can get lots of growth from it. You might not realize as you're going through it, but looking back, you can see you've grown in areas. And I don't like challenging things, so sometimes the school can be tough, um, but it's uh, try to keep a good attitude about it, and it's really rewarding. And then also, uh, just as an encouragement to young people, uh, to consider missions and ministry, uh, a passage that popped into my head was Matthew 9, verses 36 through 38. And if you want to go ahead and turn over there, before the lesson, we'll have it read from there. But this is the context about the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And we just had Matthew in my first quarter at Bear Valley. But starting in verse 36, it says, uh, this is Jesus. He's seeing the people. He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And so you might be the worker that is needed in an area. Uh, wherever that might be, you might have talents that fit an area or fit certain people that you need to reach out to uh, as a minister or maybe as a missionary. Uh, so please consider this way, and God can take you to awesome places. Uh, just in my short time at Bear Valley, I've been to help with two or three different churches, and I'm here tonight. Uh, Boise is a long way away from home for me uh, in the plains. It's up here in the mountains. I get a little bit of the mountains in Denver, but uh, the places it's taken me so far is pretty incredible already. So please consider uh, missions and ministry. Um, and also, just a thank you to the elders and the, you as a congregation. I've gotten to meet a lot of you, and you, you are great people, and you've accepted me in already and, and gotten to know me. And uh, thank you to the Johnsons. Uh, they've been shoveling me around and feeding me, and they helped me find a place to stay. And they've kind of been a family away from family. Uh, and for the Paytons, 
for taking me to lunch today. But as Larry said, I'm from outside of Kansas City, or I'm from outside of Kansas City, and about three to three and a half hours from Kansas City is a place called Branson, Missouri. And Branson, Missouri is renowned for its attractions. And one of the attractions there is called Silver Dollar City. And Silver Dollar City has a roller coaster there called Powder Keg. And Powder Keg is like many roller coasters. It has dips and turns and twists. And in our own lives, our emotions can be like a roller coaster. Uh, for example, Tuesday can be a great day, uh, but Wednesday can seem like everything is unraveling. And living through our emotions can be a tough thing to do. And the text we're going to be in today is the end of Mark chapter 15 and chapter 16. Uh, so you can go ahead and turn over there if you like. But there's, the context there is Jesus has been killed, he's been murdered, and he's laid in a tomb. And there's three women that go to the tomb, so this is a resurrection uh, context. And we're going to make some observations about these women. And specifically, we're going to make three observations about these women, and we're going to reveal them as we go along. Let's go ahead and read our text. We're going to be in Mark 16, verses 1 through 6. So verse 1 says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. So here in Mark, we see three women. We see Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. And there were at least four women. Uh, another, the other one is given in Luke, and that's Joanna. And Luke also describes some other women that possibly could have been there. So we have at least four women that go to the tomb and probably more. But the first thing we're going to observe about these, these women is their dedication and how we need to have their dedication. And these women, they were disheartened because Jesus had just died, and they had followed him. And he was like their only hope, and their only hope had just died. And when I was preparing the material, it made me think uh, to a Star Wars movie. The original Star Wars movie back in the late 70s, there's a character there, Obi-Wan Kenobi, he's called their only hope. And the rebels and Princess Leia, they reach out to him, and they gain his help. And they gain him as a person. But for these women, Jesus, they lose him in contrast so you have the contrast between these two movies. But these women, they had ministered to Jesus. Uh, Mary Magdalene had had demons cast out of her by Jesus. And these three women, along with other women, traveled from Galilee to Jerusalem with Jesus. And their heads are probably spinning. And they probably hadn't tried moving on just because of the circumstances they're in. Uh, Jesus has just been killed, and it happens pretty quickly. And you see in Luke 24, verses 5 through 8, there, the women are at the tomb, and an angel has to remind them of the words of Jesus. And Jesus had told them that he would rise again. But these women, they don't remember his words. And actually, in verse 8, it says they remembered the words of Jesus. They remembered his words. But we see that the women are disheartened. And, but through what had happened with Jesus, they uh, still seek him. They still sought him. And we see that their dedication, it overflowed or it overran even after Jesus died. And we might ask, you know, why did they go to see Jesus? Why was it for ceremonial purposes, uh, this going to see Jesus? Was that a possibility? And it probably wasn't the reason they went to go see Jesus. Uh, they were too connected to Jesus for it just to be this practical visit. Uh, it had sentimental value to it. But when we think about these women going to the tomb, we could ask some of those same questions about ourselves. We could ask, you know, are we going to see Jesus like these women were uh, because of ceremonial reasons or because of obligations we have uh, to, uh, to whatever? Or are we going to see Jesus because of the value he has to us? Uh, but asking questions like these uh, can revamp our dedication to Jesus. And we also see that these women, they stayed faithful to Jesus when others had quit. Uh, we see Judas, he went off and Judas had hung himself uh, but these women, they stayed strong. And the twelve, with the exception of Judas, initially did not go to the tomb. Uh, later, Peter and John go, but the twelve initially did not go to the tomb uh, like the women had. 
And Jesus had just been murdered, and the women witnessed this, and he's been killed. Uh, but they still courageously go to the tomb uh, with threats of possible physical harm. And they were the first ones at the tomb uh, behind the angels. Uh, if you look over in John in chapter 20, in verse 19, there's a phrase there used uh, in the New American Standard Bible. It says, for fear of the Jews. And it says, the door where the disciples were staying was shut for fear of the Jews. And that's on the day that Jesus uh, arose. So it's just a few days after he's been killed. But the circumstances are that there's still that fear of the Jews because Jesus has just been killed. But if you look at the preceding verse, in verse 18, you see that Mary Magdalene, she comes announcing to the disciples, and she says, I have seen the Lord. And she said this while there was that fear of the Jews. Verse 18 and 19, that's on the same day. That's the day that Jesus arose. So we see Mary and these women, they're courageous examples. Um, and I think we can all relate to, if we were put in this situation, to, to some degree or to some extent, we would have been afraid. I, for me, I'm more of an afraid person in certain circumstances or categories, and I think we can all say that. But I think we can all relate to this situation, possibly being afraid to some extent. extent. Uh, but we see these women, uh, they were very courageous. So that is their, their dedication, though, and how we need to have their dedication. And another observation we can make about these women is their love and how we need to have their love. And if we were to begin with an illustration, uh, for example, if you said that you love to drive, well, you would probably drive a lot. Or if you love football, you would probably play football a lot or watch football. And if you apply that to these women, you see that they loved Jesus. Uh, they had spent their lives with Jesus, and they followed him. Uh, their lives had been changed by Jesus. We mentioned Mary Magdalene had had demons cast out of her by Jesus. And Mark 16:9 says that specifically she had seven demons cast out of her. But the, the point is, is that these women, they found a way and they found time to do what they wanted to do. And they wanted to minister to Jesus. But we see that these women, they loved Jesus because they gave him their time and their effort and their lives. And we also see uh, that these women, they had Jesus on their minds. So if you look at verse 2, it says that they go early in the morning. So Jesus had been killed on that first day, the day before the Sabbath, and then the Sabbath, no one can go out on that day, and that's the second day. And then you have the third day, the day that Jesus rose, and that's the first chance they get to go out. And Jesus is on their minds, and they go very early in the morning, on the first day they can go out. And in John 20, in verse 1, it says they, they went while it was still dark. And you see that these women... They seek Jesus the first chance they get, and it's not from like this forced, unusual effort, this going to see Jesus. They do it because he's part of, Jesus is a part of their lives already, and they were just being themselves. And when you look at that concept of just being themselves, it, it reminded me of a conversation I had with my youth minister back home in Kansas City. And he was coming in, and he was a new youth minister, and in an effort to try to get to know people, he, we went out to go eat lunch together, and we were discussing a few things, and he got to know me a little bit better. But at the time, I was thinking about attending the University of Kansas, and we were talking about being a Christian on campus and different things like that. And he had mentioned how Paul had spoke to certain groups of Christians about just being themselves, and they would stand out among the Gentiles. And we see that that's what these women were doing. They were just being themselves. They continued to minister to Jesus. They had done this before he died, and they did this after he died. And Mark 15, 41 says they ministered to him, and they followed him, and they followed him from Galilee to Jerusalem. So they did it before he died. And then they, if you look in the beginning verses of Mark 16, they buy spices, and they're going to anoint him. Um, but they continue to minister to Jesus. But those are some of the ways we could see that these women love Jesus and how we need to have their love. So we've looked at their dedication and how we need to have their dedication and their love and how we need to have these women's love. And the next thing we could look at is their attitude and how we need to have their attitude. And if we look at, you know, how these women perceive Jesus and his death and then look at their mindset, some of the things, um, when you put it into how they were thinking at the time, you know, how did they view Jesus or how did they perceive Jesus? Uh, well, how did others perceive Jesus? If you look over in Matthew 14, uh, 33, 
there Jesus is walking on water. And he's get, he gets back into the boat. And those in the boat say, you are certainly God's son. And so that's how some other people, you know, recognize Jesus. That's how they thought of him. But these women, you know, how did they perceive Jesus? Maybe what are some possibilities of how they viewed Jesus? And one possibility is they thought Jesus was the Messiah, but now that he's died, you know, maybe he's not all he could be. Or maybe they got a lesser view of the Messiah. They thought the Messiah was something grand and it was up here. And then maybe with Jesus' death, it just lowered that view of the Messiah. Or maybe the women had heard of him raising other people from the dead uh, with Jesus' popularity, and they assumed he could do the same for himself. And it's probably not these two possibilities. It's probably the last couple we're going to mention here in a second. But the women, they had followed Jesus, and he just died. And they have, you know, their perception of who he is as the Messiah. And they could have said, you know, I don't care what happens. I'm going to hold on to my convictions because I know who I followed and I know Jesus and who he was, even though he died. So that's a way they could have perceived it. Another way is, you know, they thought Jesus was the Messiah and then he dies and they could have said, this is it. And they have no explanation for why Jesus died. Uh, if we remember we talked about in Luke they're not thinking about how Jesus told them that he would rise again. So they're not thinking about that. So their heads are spinning so they could have no explanation for why Jesus died. And there's also maybe an indication that they were expecting an earthly king. Like we know some others had at this time. If you look over in Luke, uh, in chapter 24, verses 13 through 35, that's the scene where there's two on the road to Emmaus and they're walking in the country and another one comes up beside them and he's walking with them and it's actually Jesus but they don't know that it's Jesus and so they're talking and this third man asks them what they're talking about and they, they tell them about the events that went on in Jerusalem and about Jesus so they tell Jesus about Jesus uh, because they don't recognize who he is but they, they say things like they thought Jesus was a prophet uh, the one to redeem Israel and so you could kind of see maybe in some of the stuff they're saying that they're just a little bit misguided into who they thought, uh, who they think Jesus is. And we, we mentioned what the angels and the women in verses 5 through 8 of chapter 24 in Luke, that these women were possibly misguided as well because the angel has to remind them that Jesus said he would rise again on the third day, but they don't remember his words, and then they do. And we see that in verse 8. And then also, if you look over in John 20, and verses 11 through 18, there a scene is described where Mary goes to the tomb and she sees that the tomb is empty and she actually thinks that somebody stole the body of Jesus. Um, but we see, you know, maybe these women were just a little bit misguided in who they thought Jesus was. So that is, you know, some possibilities of how they thought about Jesus and his death. But what is their mindset, you know, throughout all of that with Jesus and his death? And their mindset is Jesus is dead but we're going to go look for him anyways. And so they didn't get frustrated, at least at first, when they're going uh, to the tomb. Later, we see that Mary is weeping. And we see that in John uh, chapter 20, verses 11 through 18 that we brought up. So maybe she got frustrated later on. But initially, these women didn't get frustrated. They didn't give up hope as much as others had, like Judas and the other disciples. And they stayed, to me, they stayed positive. If you look at verse 3 in Mark 16, uh, it says, they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And you could just picture these women. If you go back and you plant yourself there as an innocent bystander or maybe an innocent witness, these women, they followed Jesus and then he's been killed. And you see the Sabbath day and then the first day that they had to go out, they're, they're walking up to the tomb. So you could just imagine them going up to the tomb and then just picture these women. They have bought the spices. They're going to anoint Jesus. And they say, you know, they're talking amongst themselves, and they say, who will roll away the stone for us? But you can kind of see that their heads are spinning. They, they can't even get inside the tomb if the stone is not removed. But they've already bought spices and everything. But to me, it's, that's a heartwarming verse because it makes you smile at the dedication of these women. They, after all they've been through, they're still walking up to the tomb um, with the spices and everything. But it shows... And maybe that they were taking positive action. And if you compare verse 3 to verse 10 in Mark 16, 
It says that while the women were doing this, it says that others were weeping and mourning. Uh, so there's some contrast there. And the women were uh, being positive. Um, but they didn't have all the answers, but they were staying positive. So that is their attitude and how we need to have their attitude. And so with these women, we've seen their dedication and how we need to have their dedication. And we've seen their love and how we need to have their love. And we've seen their attitude and how we need to have their attitude. Uh, but what are some further lessons we can draw out of Mark 15 and Mark chapter 16? And as you go through the back end of Mark 15 and Mark chapter 16, you see that the emphasis is on Jesus. Um, I think Clint mentioned this this morning in Matthew. But as you go through it, it kind of crescendos to the resurrection. Or that's where the climax is, is the resurrection. And that's where the emphasis is at, is with the resurrection. And these women are just a smaller part of this, this larger story uh, in Mark 16 and the end of chapter 15. And if you look, we're going to look real quickly at uh, the words he and him from Mark 15:40 through the end of the book. But go to 1541, and we're going to look at the words he and him. We're going to see him 28 times, and they show emphasis on Jesus. But for example, look at verse 41. It says, when he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. Many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And then verse 44, Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time. Verse 46, Joseph bought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb. And then verse 6 and chapter 16, skip down to that, it says, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. And then verse 7, the next verse, But go tell his disciples and Peter, He is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And then verse 9, Now after he had risen early, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. And then verse 11, when they heard that he was alive. Verse 12, after that he appeared. And then verse 14, afterward he appeared. He reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, in verse 15. But through that, we could see that the emphasis is on Jesus. And you might ask, you know, why is the emphasis on Jesus? And it's because Jesus is the most important thing in this chapter. That Jesus' resurrection would take care of all the concerns and questions and heartaches that these women would have. And the same is true for us. Our resurrection, or Jesus' second coming, if we're still living, will take care of all the concerns and questions and heartaches that we have. And, but that, another, that is one of the lessons we can draw out on top of the three observations we made about these women is that the emphasis is on Jesus. And we've also seen to be positive. These women were positive throughout this situation. They were going through a lot. But initially, when they were going to the tomb, they were positive. Um, and we also see that God can turn it around. These women, their situation was turned around by God. We see that... Um, sorry. Situation. They were disheartened, uh, and they had questions, but they were answered. And then they learned the truth about what had happened, and the angel reminds them. And once they remember the words of Jesus, um, then they, they learn what had happened. And then if you look at, we brought up John 20 in verses 11 through 18, uh, Mary Magdalene and Jesus, in that scene we brought it up, but to continue that story, Mary is there and she thinks that Jesus is the gardener. And she's asking about the body and to retrieve it and different things like that. And she turns away and Jesus says her name. He says Mary. And then she turns around and she's clinging on to him. And in that scene, she's weeping before she's clinging on to Jesus. And in that context, you could probably say that she was maybe hugging him or something like that. But from that, you could say, you know, maybe some things got turned around for Mary. Um, but God can turn it around. But just like these women were going through tough times, maybe think of families that have been through tough times. Uh, my family, my mother, she has a brain tumor, and she's doing fine. Uh, and it really hasn't affected me that much because I was younger when it happened. I was in middle school. Uh, but my folks, my parents, they emulated these three women. They kept their dedication and their love and this positive attitude for God and in general. Uh, but think of families that have emulated these three women 
and have remained good examples uh, in times of distress, uh, whether it be through unemployment or deaths or diseases or uh, sicknesses or family struggles or tragedy. Maybe think of some families uh, that have been good examples in times of distress. But we could see, you know, maybe you're saying that your family, you know, my family, is going through a tough time like these ladies were. Or maybe you're saying, you know, I'm just not where I want to be spiritually. And that's a tough thing for any of us to say and to be satisfied with that. But maybe you're, you're dispirited. We we'll realize that, as we mentioned before, that God can turn it around. In verses 5 and 6 of Mark 16, we see the word amazed used a couple times. And God amazed these women, and he can be amazing to us too, all these years later. But to be amazed by God, you have to be looking for Jesus like these women were. And you, ha- you can do that. You can look for Jesus uh, by submitting what he, tells, what he tells you to do in baptism. Or maybe you'd just like to begin your spiritual journey. And you, say, you might be saying, I have this end goal and I have these questions I need answered. And I want to be put on a journey or study with somebody who can get me these answers or get me to this end goal. Uh, maybe that's something you're saying. Or if you have any need or you want prayers for something, uh, realize that the family here is loving and it's here to help. Um, And somebody can come forward and help you and discuss things with you there. And we could offer prayers for you. But if you have any need or anything like that, and that describes you or applies to you, uh, you could come forward while we stand and while we sing.